Hey, it is Jillian JJ Simmons, and welcome to Respect My Crown, the podcast. Respect My Crown is a community designed to support women who desire to step into the abundance that awaits them. We know that now is the time to manifest our visions, realize our dreams, and accomplish our goals. Respect My Crown is a support system that encourages women to deepen in spirituality, sisterhood, accountability, and service. Today, we have a a very special guest who is completely amazing. Her name is Jemima Lee. She is a crisis counselor and advocate for Houston's police department family violence unit. And she's been there since 2013. Now her job is to counsel victims. She conducts public speaking assignments and so much more. Um, As of 2017, she now provides more assistance to all victims of crime through the Houston Police Department uh, Victim Service Unit. When I say that, it just makes me think of law and order. Like, I feel like you need your own show or something. Like, I know it's coming. Um, She is also a graduate of Mississippi Valley State University, where she received her Bachelor of Science degree in social work. And she has her Master's of Arts Counseling and Master's of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy. Therapy from Prairie View A and M University. Them Prairie View folks, they be proud, proud. They, I love some Prairie View people. Yeah. You guys, give a, a warm welcome to Jemima Lee. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for asking. I am so glad that you are a part of the show today. You and I, we did a uh, Insta live. Was it last year? Or was it? Yeah, it was last year. Yeah, it was, God, it was last early year. last year. Um, we were talking about dating abuse and February is teen dating abuse month. And I just felt that it would be great to give people some tools and maybe not even just for teens, but maybe parents of teens, you know, as we try to guide our kids in the right direction and help them to, you know, look out for some of these signs. I wanted to just chat with you a little bit about some of the things that you see, some of the statistics that we need to know about for um, folks right here uh, in our own backyard. And and also, you know, giving some some tools for people to to use that can help them in having a successful relationship. So let's maybe start with some of the stats. What's what what are we looking like when it comes to domestic abuse? Okay, so I'm gonna give you two different types of stats. One um set of numbers I'm going to provide to um, you all on today will be the numbers that come from our analysis within the Houston Police Department about the amount of cases that we have received and touched with regards to domestic violence. Now, when we do the comparisons, we do year-to-day comparisons within five, a five-year range. So I'm going to start back with, just to give you guys an idea of how serious this is um, with regards to the victims that we you know, attempt to assist or try to touch and help get assistance with pursuing the charges and so on and so forth within the Houston um, Harris County area. From 2015 to 2016, the numbers went from 21,282 to 21,728. Now, these are the domestic violence cases that we received wow. within that time frame. That was a 446 number in increase. So, from 2016 My to 2017, you had 21,728. That number increased by 615, which took us up to 22,343 cases in 2017. So we're now up to 2018. Went from 22,343 to 23,953. That was a 610 case um, increase. So from Mm. 2018 to 2019, you have 23,953 to 23,927. So as you can see, it went down 26. That's not a drastic change uh, at all. That kind of gives those that are on the outside of law enforcement that don't have access to these type of numbers, great insight on the type of things that we deal with. Now, keep in mind, this is year-to-day comparisons for the Houston Police Department. 
you have other surrounding areas that are not listed on these numbers that I do not have privy to because I don't work for those agencies. But that is a lot of, lot of individuals that also yeah. include the, the teenagers as far as like 17, because we deal with 17 and up in my division with regards to family violence. Right. And we will receive those numbers again starting um, in September. I will have new numbers for September 2019 to September of 2020. I can only hope that those numbers have decreased significantly um, with regards to the amount of individuals that are being abused, um, physically abused within the Houston area. Those are some very, very oh. shocking numbers. Um, that's something that we, um, as a state within the state of Texas, they, they do a lot of things for victims of domestic violence to hope that we can decrease these numbers somehow, someday, to the point where it's possibly zero. And I know that's a long yeah. way from here, but with all the resources that are coming out now and with your podcast and with everything that you do for every individual, I can only hope that they listen and they accept what we have to offer because we're here to most definitely help them any way that we can. Why do you think the numbers grow? Well, the numbers grow, honestly, because a lot of victims, they do get to that point where I am tired. And, and unfortunately, too, within those number of victims, you have a lot of repeat victims. Um, because as you know, yeah. statistics do say that they go back at least seven times. It sometimes takes that amount of time for them to say, I am done. Um, not for all. You have some individuals go through it that one time, and they say, I am done. I am finished. This is not how I was raised. I would not allow it. They walk away. They do what they need to do. They don't go back. But the sum total of numbers can be so many different things. The victim finally getting tired. Again, you have the same, sometimes they repeat victims. And then you have a lot of immigrant individuals that are learning the system that we are now encountering through a lot of public speaking engagements because you have to think about it. The one thing that they do not like about law enforcement is if I talk to them, I'm going to be deported. And we're here to say and let them know yeah. that that's not true. You didn't do anything wrong, but, of course, this is coming from the mouth of a batterer. They're going to believe anything. I wouldn't want to go back to someone, somewhere I escaped from to have a better life, a better living for me and my children. So now you came in counter with someone that knows the system, knows that they can use if you call law enforcement on me. I'll deport you. I'll call yeah. I'll call you. This, this is what they actually do. So a lot of our victims are now speaking up because they're hearing by way of public speaking engagements or by someone they knew that went through it, hey, there is help for us as immigrant women. Yeah. yeah. Don't be afraid. Speak out. It's a challenge for people to know where to go for the resources um, unless it gets to the point where there is an arrest and uh, and then, you know, you have people in the system who are able to direct these victims to the right reasons. But a lot of people who don't go to the police may find it challenging to get resources. Can you talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available to people? Yes. Like with regards to crime victims compensation, that is something that's given by the Texas Attorney General Office. We have been privy within the police, the Houston Police Department to have a unit called Victim Service Unit, which services all victims within the Houston um, Harris County area, actually. And, and of course, it has, for us, it has to be a case within our jurisdiction for us to be able to assist them. But every county has a counselor or an advocate within their department that can help a victim of abuse, sexual assault, terroristic threats, stalking, what, what may have you, um, whatever they're coming in for. So the one thing, crime victims compensation, let's say if I was a victim of domestic violence, due to my injuries, I cannot go to work. I cannot do for myself, I cannot pay my hospital bills. It's because I have a job, I have health insurance. Sometimes when we go to the hospital, we have x-rays, things of that nature. So mm -hmm. with that being said, you may more than likely receive a bill related, related to those x-rays or, you know, remaining balance, period. 
So what Crime Victims Compensation does for a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, any crime pretty much, you basically will receive that assistance from the Texas Attorney General Office by simply filling out this application. And honestly, you can go on, they can go online and look up crime victims compensation for the state of Texas. It's very thorough. It's very self-explanatory for how they can sign up online even. Now, the flip side to that, because you do have victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, which is family violence for us, and then you have those that fall on that side of major assault. So some sexual assault victims or major assault victims do not know their attacker in some cases. Like, we can be in the parking lot and don't know one another, but we're fighting over a parking space. I don't know you, you don't know me, but I injure you. You file a police report against me. Now, you can also fill out the paperwork for crime victims' compensation to get your medical bills paid and get reimbursement for time that you lost on your job, and you don't have to be pursuing with charges through the Houston Police Department because you may or may not never know who that person was. And that's the same thing for sexual assault right. victims if you do not know you're a su- that suspect. But now, when it comes to family violence, it says it all within the name. That means you know that person, whether it be a friend, a roommate, cousin, mother, father, sister, brother, you kind of get it. You have to be pursuing with charges in order for crime compensation to pretty much reimburse for those hospital bills, your loss of wages, psychiatric care. And that is for so many reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is for that suspect to pay for what he did in restitution costs to that victim through the state. You have to be pursuing with charges. Um, one mm-hmm. of the negative sides of that, and they do it that way because you do have, unfortunately, a lot of victims that receive the benefits of the state with regards to crime victims compensation, but they later on turn around and they go back to that suspect. That's mm-hmm. not uncommon. Yeah. We are all human. We all love differently because well, guess what? Uh, people, they, say, they say, I'm sorry, a lot. I would never do it again. And unfortunately, you have a lot of yeah. victims that do believe that. So there are certain stipulations, depending on what side of the coin you fall on, with getting these resources. So confidence compensation will pay for, like, again, your medical, your psychiatric care um, if you need that. They actually even help you with daycare if you have children that you have removed from these situations and you need that assistance. So daycare is provided. Then on the other side of that, you have what's called a relocation package that's also given from um, Texas Attorney General Office to victims of any crime. You know, um, and again, with that one, you have to be really careful because that suspect can find out where you are. If you get back with that suspect, they will have you to, hey, you kind of have to pay that back because you took money from victims that's pretty much could have needed and used those um, resources. Yeah. So they That's do smart. reimbursement um, for relocation. Some people, for those that have the money to pay up front, they do reimbursement. And for those that don't, they actually do it prior to. They would pay directly to that leasing office or whatever, um, I guess, person that you're renting from. It doesn't necessarily be an apartment. They just have to be able to speak to someone that you are renting their property from and have a, con- a written contract with you and that person in order for them to pay that person directly. I know you and I kind of talked last year about dating apps and how you are seeing significant numbers of victims of abuse uh, coming from dating apps. Can you share a couple of those stories with us so people can be aware of what to look out for and how to protect themselves? Okay. So I have about a couple of cases. I won't go through all of them. And, again, I won't say any names due to the sake of confidentiality, but this is the realness. This is what people need to know. Um, So I had um, a male. This is a male victim. He met this person on Plenty of Fish. They, they, They were dating for a few months. He allowed her to move in with him after a couple of weeks of them becoming intimate. And so from that time, he confronted her because she basically never got off the app. So he confronted her about dating and talking with other individuals and things like that. So in return, she gets very aggressive. She grabs him. She punches him. She scratches him. And he was in awe because he's like, I really can't believe this because, 
you know, I allowed you to come into my home because you had nowhere to go. So long story short with this case, he couldn't pursue the charges because he did not know her real name. Everything oh that she gosh. told him about you... herself was not true at all. So no suspect, no charges. So that's one case. So I have another one right here. Um, this is Mel and Mel Partners. He met this, and they met on the site called Jacked. I'm not sure if you heard of it, um, but you do. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of individuals of same-sex relationship that go to this site and meet individuals of their liking. So this Mel, he met this individual. They were dating for three months. They spoke over the phone only, and um, out of the blue, the guy said, okay, I'm ready to meet you. This is the suspect I'm speaking of. I'm ready to meet you. Let's meet up. So the complainant meets up with him in the parking lot um, at this complex. The suspect says, hey, I need for you to take me to the north side of town. I just say the north side of town. And the guy was like, he, started, he said he started feeling like this was a setup or something because he told the guy more about him than the guy told him about himself. So the guy knew that he had mm. a really good job, had a really nice car. So he started feeling like all of a sudden since I said this, now I'm feeling like this is a setup. So he tells the suspect, no, I'm not sure about that. This is our first time meeting. I'm not comfortable taking you and driving you somewhere far, you know, and I don't really know you like that. This is our first time meeting. This guy gets very upset, turns to the left of him because the guy's in the driver's seat, punches him repeatedly in the face to, until he busted his nose. Blood just went oh. everywhere. Guess what? Oh, my God. He couldn't pursue with charges. He wanted to, but all he had was his screen name on that particular site. And <sighs> since that incident, that guy deleted that profile. So we have another Oh, one. my gosh. This particular, um, this is a female on male partner. They were together for a couple of months. She did, they didn't specify the amount of months. They just had a couple. He moved in with them being together within those couple of months. So he was living for her for about a month. Lo and behold, she's six weeks pregnant by this person that she just met. So she became Ooh. irritated with regards to his lack of contribution with staying with her. She started, you know, so telling him, like, you have to go. I no longer want you here. I don't want you to be a part of me and my child's life. You're not helping me. This is not what I signed up for. Clearly, he has nowhere to go. He threatens her and says, you can't put me out. I've been living here for a month. I know the law, Right. So she goes on to start to try to pack his things. He goes into the room, picks her up by her throat. Her feet are actually dangling. dangling. Remember, she's six weeks pregnant. He does not care. He's strangling her, and the only reason he let her go is because he saw that she was about to pass out, and he let her go. So after he did that, he took a knife, put it to her neck. If you call the police, I'll come back and kill you. So for her, she had a name. She had a name Mm -hmm. first. But when she, we ran him, this person doesn't even really exist yet. Did not, it, he was not, again, a false name. And so she that is so devastated. And, and I told her, I completely understand your reason for being devastated. This is someone that you are now currently pregnant by. So you don't, you don't even know who to name this child by because that's not his real name. So oh my those goodness. cases that I just read to you pretty much, two things they have in common. They met on dating sites, and they lack information about that person. And so some of the things that if I can get people to understand or get them to be aware of is when, and, and it's not a dating site problem. You, if this is an individual problem because a lot of people blame plenty of fish they blame Jack. They blame, you know, the other dating sites. But technically, it is the individuals themselves. You have to take, take that into account that plenty of fish can only allow you to put on there what you want to put on there. You are your own individual. So I would say to anyone right. um, what they can do, probe a little. It's okay to be nosy. Ask about their family. Ask about what they, what they do for a living. Ask them where they work. You know, run them if you have the means to run them. You have a lot of systems that you can run them through, like the Harris County District Clerk Office. You can run that name through. They have the criminal. They have the civil. They have the family sections on that site. You can run them through Intellis. Now, these other sites you have to pay for, like Intellis, Seek, Verify, 
instant check mate, truth finder, even pipple. Again, these are sites you have to pay for, but for your sanity and your safety, try to do something. Because nine times out of ten, that person name mm-hmm. is listed on their profile, and what they give you is not going to be who they are. Try to see IDs, you know. Um, and the most important thing is slow down. A lot of these individuals allow these people to come into their homes early on. They allow that individual to just take part in life, to take from them. They, they had no really, no real intentions on being with these individuals. They were just leeching off of them. And what I hated for all of these mm-hmm. victims, oh, they could not get justice because we, as a department, have no real names, no true identifiers as to who they are. So I would say oh, be wow. nosy. Ask questions. Be it can nosy. Help Listen. Somebody needs to holler at me about it because I'm putting together a whole worksheet for people to fill out when I date. I need you to fill this whole <laughs> eight-page form out. Real applications. I need to know you <laughs> Your mama's mental health, your daddy's mental health. I need to know your cousin's social security. I'm getting everything because, you know, Mm -hmm. what's unfortunate is when you meet people, especially in these abusive relationships, they um, they love bomb. And so, you know, for that first I don't know for I guess everyone is different. But for me, it was the first four months of everything was so perfect. And, you know, we started having those conversations about moving in together. And I was like, man, it just feels like it's moving too quickly. And that Uh is a great sign right there for people to pay attention to. If it feels like uh, it's moving too fast or this isn't the pace that you really desire, then be aware of that. You just said something about signs, knowing the signs. And if I can't have, I have Mm -hmm. enough time, I can share some of the warning signs for individuals that are getting into any relationship, not that you want to get into these relationships thinking that person is a narcissist or an abuser or a manipulator. It's a simple fact that you need to be cautious. So some of the signs that you know you're dealing with someone that's a batterer is that they've hit you before. They've hit their former partners or spouse. They express anger physically. They're controlling. They're about isolation, jealousy. They blame others. They resent your success, like not wanting you to work, not wanting you to further your career by going to college, getting other degrees. They, they're they violent drinkers or substance abusers. Um, they're unable to empathize. It's battering in their family, like the violence in their family. Know that person's background if you can. Severe mood swings and unable to express themselves clearly. Because one thing that's for sure, two things for certain, that an individual that has an anger problem, it is going to be hard for them to control themselves for too long. That representative does not last long. Ooh, that is so real. Jemima Ali, I want to thank you so much for being a part of our podcast today. I look forward to chatting with you again, maybe for Domestic Abuse Month in October. Okay, yeah, and I have some different numbers for you. We're going to hope that the numbers decrease that's right we got to do better we got to do better thank you jemima lee for being a part of the show today you are tuned in to respect my crown the podcast if you want to get more information on respect my crown the movement the books the podcast make sure you log on to respectmycrown.com